Okay, so thank you all for coming. I really, we really appreciate your uh, joining us today. Uh, the idea is really uh, not to have, not to talk at you for uh, most of the day, but to stimulate some ideas uh, so that we can together develop a research agenda for the next four years. So really, the, the outcome here is uh, uh, what we're going to come up with in terms of that research agenda. And, and I started with the realization that, well, before we have, uh, can really talk about a research agenda, we have to have a common evidence base. And the evidence base is often in the sorts of indicators we look at and uh, the sorts of uh, uh, data and uh, relevant information we have. Um, and so since um, I know we're all very convinced that uh, unemployment rates are uh, uh, essentially partial, very partial indicators, they have been getting a lot of attention in this region. Uh, and when you look at what's out there that's comparative across the countries of the region, uh, you really can't go beyond the unemployment rate much. Uh, maybe you have labor force participation and uh, employment rates, but then uh, how can we go move the conversation further uh, to more in-depth uh, uh, indicators? Now, let's see if I can get this to move. Okay, here we go. Um, so, so basically, uh, we know that create, creating more and better quality jobs is the main challenge uh, facing this region, and that's something that I don't need to convince you of. Uh, good data infrastructure is essential to that and uh, to good policy making. Uh, ERF has been making big strides in improving the data infrastructure uh, uh, in cooperation with the national statistical offices. Uh, and I think we need a, a lot more work needs to be done, but uh, there's considerable amount that uh, was done. And also in opening up the data infrastructure so that it becomes really available uh, for researchers and others to, uh, uh, to be able to use it to make uh, important insights for policy making. Um, now, we know that these North African countries do have a specificity that uh, is a commonality, which is uh, they do have very high unemployment rates, especially among youth. Uh, but, uh, but let's try and see if we can move beyond that and see uh, what else do we have in common. Um, now, I'm going to argue that unemployment rates, while important, really focus attention on a very specific group of people, and those are young people looking for their first formal job. And since formal employment is uh, often uh, provided by the government or by the public sector and by a very small uh, private sector, uh, it often is worth queuing for that kind of employment. And it's those who can afford to queue basically you have families are able to uh, subsidize them while they're queuing that, are, that show up in the unemployment uh, uh, queue, whereas the, most of the others who are, not, are unable to afford to queue don't show up as unemployed at all. That doesn't mean they don't have labor market problems. Doesn't mean that they're not able to, uh, they're not struggling to get good livelihoods in the labor market. And so focusing on the unemployment rate really uh, focuses your attention immediately on those relatively pri privileged groups who are able to wait for these uh, formal jobs. And, and I will um, give you some evidence, at least a suggested evidence uh, to that effect in, in the case of uh, Egypt, but uh, I'm sure uh, similar evidence uh, could be obtained for the other countries of the region as well. So, so I'm arguing that we need to supplement the unemployment rate uh, as well as the other aggregate labor market indicators with a whole bunch of additional labor market uh, indicators. And I'm going to base a lot of the indicators that I propose today on uh, the work of the uh, ILO and the various international conferences of labor statisticians, as well as the proposed indicators for, uh, from the UN to monitor the sustainable development goals. Uh, because I think those are going to become extremely important for countries to show how well they're doing uh, on these goals in the next uh, 15 years or so. Um, so uh, we're talking about indicators in seven areas. Uh, labor underutilization, so unemployment falls within that category, but there are a number of others. Uh, now, type of employment, and in particular, a focus on informality uh, as an important aspect of employment uh, in, this, in this region and elsewhere. Uh, 
uh, the regularity of employment and uh, working time. So this is the extent to which people are able to get regular employment, to get enough employment uh, to, to, uh, that they desire. Um, and, and then, uh, um, and this has to do with vulnerability to, uh, to uh, external, to economic shocks and downturns in the economy. Uh, earnings and non-wage benefits, we hear very little about those because the data is often not, not there or not that good, but we need to definitely improve uh, our ability to measure earnings in general and, uh, um, and uh, both wage and non-wage, as well as uh, non-wage benefits in, uh, uh, in terms of quality of employment. Social protection, we're doing a little bit better on that, uh, but we definitely have more to go on measuring uh, 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 the proportion of people who are covered by the social insurance scheme, by other social protection schemes, uh, and uh, the extent to which the safety net is uh, accessible to most people. Um, safety and health at work, this is things like work injuries, uh, occupational hazards at work, there is very little information about that. And then finally, uh, an area where this region is uh, fairly behind on is uh, issues of industrial relations, workers' rights, uh, bar uh, collective bargaining, uh, 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 strike activity, uh, work lockouts, that sort of thing, where uh, this area we have been uh, uh, quite, quite behind on. Um, now, Let's just, we know the stylized facts. I'm not going to belabor uh, the stylized facts on the region. I'm just going to show you some data, the very low labor force participation rates. But it's not only the fact that they are low, but they're also going in the wrong direction. They are declining. And that's, a real, that's the real problem here. It's the trend in labor force participation that we have to worry about. Uh, we have um, uh, not only declining among women, but also among men as well. And then there are the, uh, and that, that's driven by declining employment to population ratios. Um, now, the, the high unemployment rates I don't have, have to uh, uh, speak a lot about, but uh, there's also this large increase in unemployment post Arab Spring. So let me show you some data. This is data from uh, the uh, ILO modeled estimates for the region, and so you will see that. Uh, uh, as this is labor force participation for those 15 plus. We, as far as men are concerned, we're more or less uh, at the world average, maybe a little bit below the world average, uh, but there is this declining trend, which happens to be uh, declining around the world, not just uh, for, for the world average, but in the region it's declining a bit faster in, in the period since the Arab Spring, since 2012. That, that, that thick black line is the region average, and most of the region is following that trend as far as men are concerned. Now, for women, we have uh, essentially, I don't know if this pointer works, yeah, so we are much well below the world average for sure, uh, and it was increasing for a while, but then since 2012, we're also in a declining trend uh, for women, and so a lot of the countries, even the ones with the lowest level of labor force participation, have reached a peak and are kind of declining uh, since uh, 2012. So this is just basically on, on labor force participation. We're not only, we're not catching up, basically. The, the, the catch up is not there. Um, now, to go to employment to population ratio look very much the same. And uh, that's what's driving uh, the low participation. And we will see that, if anything, uh, employment to population ratio trends are worse because unemployment is on the rise. Uh, so that the, um, uh, the, again, especially among men, uh, we, sorry, go back. The, uh, the decline in, uh, in the employment to population ratio in recent years is quite, quite worrisome. Now, what's going on with unemployment? Well, we, we, as Luca said, there were, there were declining trends in unemployment uh, before the Arab Spring, and both for men and for women. But then there is this huge bump in unemployment as a result of the Arab Spring. It's a bump and then stability for men, and it's a bump and continuing increase overall for the region uh, since the uh, the Arab Spring, or even a little bit preceding uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, 
So, so we have, uh, uh, yes, we do have a serious unemployment issue, and it is primarily uh, among the youth, and this is, again, showing the world average is down here, and we are way up there, especially for women, female unemployment, the gap between the world average and our unemployment, youth unemployment rates are extremely high. And, and, uh, and, and they're going in the, in mostly in the wrong direction. So, so I think the, the established stylized facts are easy to see, and I, I won't dwell too much on them. Uh, just to say that, that we, we are uh, uh, more or less kind of uh, outliers uh, in the world. So not only are women's participation rates very low, but most of that participation is taking on the form of unemployment rather than employment. So, so there are some serious issues. It's not about uh, labor supply. Labor supply seems to be there. It's about uh, accommodating uh, these women in with the jobs that are available in the labor market uh, at present. Um, OK, so what about the relationship of unemployment with uh, important characteristics such as education and uh, uh, and, and family wealth. Uh, so we start with it. This is data from Egypt based on the 2012 survey. I wasn't able to update it to 2018. This comes from the Egypt Labor Market Panel Survey rather than the Labor Force Survey. But clearly there is an increasing trend of unemployment with education, right? It, it's, an, it's an increasing trend of unemployment with education uh, for men. For women, it's also increasing, but then kind of uh, uh, stabilizes. Uh, but uh, actually, it, it continues increasing. So the, the higher the education rate, the higher the unemployment rate. Well, should we not worry then about what's going on with the labor market uh, plight of people with lower levels of education? They seem to be employed and therefore uh, are fine. That's just being sarcastic. Uh, now, the next is the relationship that that's what the one that worries me the most and very few people actually look at that is the relationship with unemployment with parental wealth. We're able to measure the wealth of the, uh, the parent's household uh, and in fact we're able, because this is data from 2012, we have panel data, we're able to go back six years earlier and see so that the employment status of the individual is not driving the wealth, it's primarily uh, their parents' parental wealth uh, household. A and there you have this uh, relationship which most people uh, don't assume that, at least for men and, and to some extent for women, unemployment rate rises with parental wealth. So that shows you that essentially it is those who can be supported by their parents are the ones who can afford to be unemployed. So the unemployment is uh, a luxury to some extent. And, and, uh, and when you focus so much on the unemployment rate and trying to do something about it, you're really responding to the needs of the, of the four, fourth and fifth quintile who, are, who are, have very high unemployment rates and, and who are worried about it. To some extent, the third quintile for women. Now, for women, the, so for, for men, the, the option of not being unemployed is to be informally, uh, sorry, informally employed, is to fall back on the informal economy. Whereas for women, the, uh, the option, the second best option to be employed is actually to be out of the labor force. And, and so we see that I also have put here the employment rate, and it's quite low uh, among low-income low women as well. So, so if we're interested in uh, labor market indicators that are inclusive, that worry about the needs of uh, people at all levels of income and, and wealth, we really need to, go, to move, move well, beyond, well beyond the unemployment rate as a measure. So let's, let's talk about uh, a few of these uh, measures that we could look at that can capture uh, what's going on elsewhere in the uh, distribution. And one measure uh, that should supplement the unemployment rate. Now, the unemployment rate, the way we measure it uh, is those who are not working at least one hour in the uh, reference week, who, are, uh, uh, who would like to work, who desire to work, who are available to start work within two weeks 
and who are actively seeking employment. So these are the criteria that are necessary to define who is unemployment by, unemployed by the standard definition. Now increasingly what we see that actively seeking work is dropping off. People find that there's no point actively seeking work, so the, the three other criteria apply, they're not working, they are uh, uh, available for work, uh, and they desire work, but they're not actively seeking, and we call those the dis discouraged job seekers. And, and in fact, in the case of Egypt, we find that although in the 12, 2012 to 2018 period, the unemployment rate in the standard definition has actually gone down, if you look at the unemployment rate by the broad definition, which includes the discouraged job seekers, it's gone up, and gone up substantially among women in particular. So, uh, so uh, it does matter. Um, another indicator which has been quite important for young people uh, is the need not in education, employment, or training. Uh, and that is basically just basically looking at whether you're employed or not, and whether you're in education or not, or whether you're in training or not. And if, you, if, if you're in neither of the three, you are considered neat, and it's usually looked at for people who are 15, for youth 15 to 24. And again, this indicator tends to be very high for this region, um, and, and uh, not just for women, but also for men. Now, one has to be careful, because in some countries, uh, uh, military service, mandatory military service, is not considered employment. In Egypt, for example, they consider it to be out of the labor force. So if you're going, to, and they will immediately go into the NEAT uh, indicator. So you'd better be careful to exclude those because you're going to get uh, all the draftees in the military uh, within your uh, NEAT indicator, at least among men. Uh, now, this one is the one I consider to be a very important measure of labor underutilization, especially for the most vulnerable workers. Uh, because it captures very well the ability of people, especially who are casual uh, workers, who have fairly uh, weak connections to the labor market, uh, their ability to get jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. And, uh, and that is uh, the time-related underemployment. So essentially, it's if a worker is working fewer than 35 hours per week, you, and you ask them, uh, uh, why are they working fewer than 35 hours? If it's because of lack of employment opportunities, and in fact they desire more hours, then they are considered to be time-related underemployed. And this indicator we find is extremely sensitive to the economic cycle. Much unlike the unemployment rate, which is structural, which doesn't really fluctuate all that much with the economic cycle, uh, the indicator of time-related underemployment does fluctuate significantly, and it's highly concentrated among very vulnerable groups, such as those informally employed uh, outside fixed establishments, for example. Um, now, another indicator which the ILO proposes, which adds to uh, the discouraged job seekers and the unemployed, this adds another category, which is those who are uh, currently uh, outside uh, the labor force. They say they're, they're not ready or not available for work, but they may still be seeking work, thinking about joining the, the workforce. And this is an indicator that I have never seen. Uh, kind of it includes these, um, uh, these job seekers not, who are not currently available to, to define what is the potential labor force. Uh, this indicator has not been calculated as far as, far as I know for any country in the region. So that's as far as the extent of underutilization uh, in the economy, and we're mostly using here visible underutilization. So we're not considering uh, people who are just employed in very low productivity activities uh, who could be upgraded to higher productivity activities. Um, type of employment is, an, is extremely important, and I think essentially it should be used as a classif classifying variable for everything we're going to discuss thereafter because uh, what type of employment you have really determines the wages, the, um, the earnings, the job, the job quality conditions, uh, and all of the later stuff that we're going to be looking at. 
So, and here I, I want to make a distinction between public versus private. So we have a lot of public employment in this region, whether it's public enterprises or government, I think it has fa fairly similar characteristics, uh, versus private employment, uh, that's kind of a first distinction. The second distinction is within private, we worry about wage versus non-wage, and non-wage here includes employers, uh, unpaid family workers, and self-employed. Uh, now, within the wage, I think the distinction between formal and informal uh, is extremely important. And here, we are, we are basing that based on the employment relationship, not on the sector in which uh, the person is working. So, if the employment relationship is not uh, covered by social insurance coverage, uh, and this is based on the um, recommendation of the 15th and 17th, International Conference of Labor Statisticians, then uh, the, the worker is considered to be informally employed. Now, I would uh, make the further distinction, uh, so let's go, go back here, within uh, this category of especially informal wage employees, whether the worker is informally employed inside an establishment, a fixed place of work, or outside a fixed establishment in a field, in a construction site, at home, in a, in a vehicle, in the street. Because that really makes a big distinction in terms of the job conditions that are available or uh, that the worker is subjected to. So, so format, informality in establishment and outside establishment is an important uh, dimension. Um, now, among uh, non-wage workers, we have the three categories of employers, own account workers, and contributing family workers. Uh, but again, we can, within those, we can distinguish between inside and outside establishment as being a relevant, uh, a relevant category. And, and I would really seriously recommend using this classification of type of employment as uh, a, a looking, a classifying variable for all uh, uh, relevant categories after that. Okay, so now we move to uh, regularity of employment. And, and here, the question is often asked, are you uh, a permanent worker, a temporary worker, a seasonal worker, or an intermittent worker? Uh, and I don't know if all the countries are asking that question in the same way, but what we're trying to get at here are workers with low connections to the labor markets in terms of their attachment to a particular employ employer. So I would include permanent and temporary as regular because they have a, a, an employer in which they have a, a relationship to, even though that relationship may not be indefinite. Uh, and then I would, I would include seasonal and intermittent as irregular or casual. And these are the people who are kind of vulnerable to, um, are moving from one employer to another uh, uh, on a regular basis and, and may not be able to get work all the time. Uh, now, irregularity of employment is strongly connected to the uh, uh, time-related underemployment I talked about earlier. Uh, now, we also want to measure weekly hours of work because that's also a measure of attachment uh, to the workforce, and these are some of the categories that uh, the ILO uh, recommends. Uh, now, earnings is an area that uh, we do fairly poorly at uh, in this region. We have made some progress in measuring wage earnings, but not so well uh, uh, the non-wage earnings, uh, earnings from self-employment, and uh, are, are still not very well captured. Uh, but uh, clearly, we want to talk about nominal and real hourly wages uh, and earnings. Uh, we want to talk about monthly uh, real and uh, nominal uh, earnings. We want to determine which group of workers are considered to be low pay, and the ILO actually defines uh, a threshold. Uh, the threshold that is recommended by the ILO is two-thirds of the median hourly earnings. So if you're below two-thirds of the median, you're considered low pay. Uh, this is, some people connect that to the poverty line and try to use the poverty line as a way to define the low, low pay line, but I think this is an international convention that we'd all be uh, good to try and apply and uh, 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 just two-thirds of the median uh, hourly earnings. Um, 
Now, in terms of non-wage benefits, uh, we have whether or not the worker receives paid leaves, regular paid leave, uh, vacation, whether they receive sick leave, and whether they obtain health insurance are the three of the most important ones that uh, we could look at. And of course, as you know, these are strongly connected to, to informality uh, of employment. Um, now, one other measure that uh, is recommended, uh, uh, especially in the SDGs, uh, is that you are working poor. And here you have to have uh, household income and expenditure data, uh, as well as labor force data. So, uh, and so this comes usually from, uh, from household income and expenditure surveys. So you are employed, but living in a household with a per capita expenditure of less than 1.9 US dollars a day in PPP terms. It could be, you could use the, the national poverty line there, uh, or you could use the international one, which is uh, $1.9 uh, a day in 2011 PPP dollars. Uh, but, but I think for international comparisons, it might as well uh, use the, um, the, uh, the international poverty line. Um, now, in terms of uh, social protection, uh, we, we have uh, the share of the population which is above the legal Pen pen legal pensionable age, legal retirement age, that is receiving an old age pension. Uh, that is a number that uh, depends on both contributory and non-contributory pensions. The, some countries have universal non-contributory pensions after age 65. Um, <clears throat> but, but kind of seeing the coverage of the elderly who have a pension. We look at the active contributors to social insurance as a percentage of the labor force. That's uh, strongly connected to the informality definition we had before, since that was also based on social insurance coverage. Uh, we look at the, uh, the share of unemployed receiving unemployment benefits. I think in this region, it's very few actually do receive uh, unemployment benefits. And uh, we also have social and health protection coverage as a percent of the total population. Uh, that, that does not necessarily need to be uh, through work, but it's a, it's a health coverage, uh, public health, social health coverage as a percent of the population. Uh, and then finally, there is an SDG indicator which looks at the proportion of the population covered by social protection floor, which brings together many of these social protection coverage uh, together, but then they look at specific groups that are uh, vulnerable, such as children, the unemployed, the elderly, uh, the persons with disability, pregnant women, newborns, uh, and a variety of others. So this is uh, an important SDG indicator which we should all try to uh, adopt and calculate uh, for our countries. Um, safety and health at work, we have very little data on that in this region. We've started collecting some of this in uh, the, the labor market panel surveys, the more recent ones, uh, but those are not official surveys. Uh, but exposure to fatal and non-fatal occupational in injuries uh, by type of injury and the days lost to cases of occupational in injury with temporary incapacity uh, is another important one. And we see that that actually at least from the data we have on Egypt, correlates quite strongly with those who are in this informal employment outside of establishments. This is a group that is highly vulnerable to this kind of injury, and therefore they're not working in workplaces that collect any such data. So you have to really get at that uh, through survey, uh, survey work. Um, and then finally, another the, the area that we have even less information on, uh, because there is not much happening outside the public sector is the collective bargaining cover coverage rate and the days not work due to strikes or lockouts and also union membership, uh, union membership by various kinds of unions, whether it's professional syndicates or uh, labor syndicates. So um, we're hoping that we sent all of these indicators to the various teams from the different countries. So we're hoping that in the next session, we're going to hear from the various teams about to what extent these indicators are covered within their uh, country statistics and what we are able to bring together. And that should be uh, hopefully the basis, the, the informational basis for the next report to at least sh to see to what extent we're able to cover uh, those labor market outcomes um, uh, 
uh, in, in the countries represented. Now, uh, just quickly, so we have uh, essentially a region in which the growth pattern, as Luca said, uh, has not been inducing uh, high quality employment. Uh, there's been, it's been jobless to a great extent. As we see, the employment to population ratios have been declining despite the growth. However, when the growth uh, does result in employment, it tends to be resulting in low quality employment, and particularly in informal employment. And, and uh, the jobs that are uh, created are often precarious. So when the economy is doing well, people are finding work. But as soon as the downturn happens, they uh, return into to the state of, uh, uh, of vulnerability and irregularity. And, and that's because a lot of the growth, the type of growth that has been driven in this region, and I think I hope we pick that up in, in, the, in, in the third session uh, this morning, uh, uh, has been growth that's been based on real estate development, housing development. Most private investment is not going to productive sectors, but is going to these sectors that provide essentially poor quality jobs. Uh, so, so this work out informal outside of establishments is, is where the action seems to be, at least from looking at the data on Egypt, that seems to be what's driving uh, employment growth uh, in Egypt. And, and, um, and while these workers are doing relatively better now because the economy is picking up and the growth rate is high, the moment the next downturn will come, they will uh, feel the uh, tremendous uh, uh, dislocation and irregularity um, and, uh, and the underemployment that we we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, we have the, the rising expectations of the growing numbers of educated workers uh, and, and that also Luca mentioned. Now, they are often not satisfied with the kind of jobs that the economies are producing, those informal jobs, especially those uh, uh, related to things like construction, et cetera, and their aspirations are uh, uh, very important to meet, at least from a, a political necessity point of view. So I'm going to stop here, and hopefully we'll hear from the country teams about how successful we are to bring these indicators together from the various countries. Thank you very much.